Amen. All right. Um, so we've been on a series, and honestly, the most beautiful thing for me about this whole series is that I see God's people responding to this gospel, right? You know, there's a part of the gospel that you need to preach, and there's a part whereby God's people need to hear. There's a power where God's people need to believe and receive. And once they receive and experience it, then they manifest, right? So, and I think from November 6, I started a series on the good news of Christ. And then we did that for five months. And just last month, I started a series on the manifestations of the Spirit. And we started talking about the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. And then we took a long time, I think about four sessions, to just discuss about the fruit of the Spirit. And then after that, we started talking about the gift of the Spirit. And then we started with tongues. And then before we even start the gift of the Spirit, we started by saying, uh, you must be born again. When we talk about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, it is something only for the born again believer right the subject of the holy spirit is not what you have with the world so to say um, when we start having teachings of manifestation the gift is something you tell the people that are already born again so you remind them now that you're born again you have the spirit of god and don't let anybody ever make you doubt the fact that you have the spirit of god that is the gift the promise god gave to you when you got born again so you got born again you received the holy spirit when I got born again, I thought I have to achieve the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that God gave me the Spirit, or better, the Holy Spirit, when I got born again, immediately, that same spot. Um, so well, we, we already established that. So a man must be born again. What does, it need to be, what does it mean to be born again? You must believe in Jesus and what he has done. What did he do? Jesus did for you and for me what we could never do for ourselves. What did he do? He died for our sins. And then God raised him from the dead for our justification. And then Romans chapter 6 says, when he died, we were baptized unto his death. Right? So your whole self died when Jesus died on the cross. And then in resurrection, when God raised Jesus from the dead, God raised every one of us in him. And that's actually the baptism the Bible is actually talking about. I'm not against water baptism. <laughs> I don't have issues with it, but more beyond the tradition that is the truth behind it that we were buried we died with christ and we we're buried with him and god raised us with him and made us sit at his right hand a right hand is a place of authority and that is where we actively are right now so now that you are born again you have the spirit of god so when we preach that for about five months we start saying now that you have the spirit of god because you have the spirit of god you can manifest and give expression to the manifestation of the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit, in fact, what God gave you was not speaking in tongues, was not tongues, was not prophecy. What God gave us when we got born again is His Spirit. Glory to God. Let us check the book of Acts chapter 2. Let's just start on that note. Acts of Apostles chapter 2. The book of Acts of Apostles chapter 2. Thank you, Jesus. Acts of Apostles chapter 2. Now, I've, I've explained this before, right? This was not the day that these guys got born again. These guys were already born again, but they were not filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? Pause your Bible for a second. I, I never explained this, but let me just explain this again. So when I got born again, for example, that was not the day I spoke in tongues. That was not the day I got in quote. There's a punchline we use for it. The Bible used it a lot. It's called filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are rightly taught, actually, they would. if you listen to the gospel, the person who actually preached to you should actually also tell you that you can manifest the gift of the Spirit the second you get born again, right? So it's not maybe something in the future you have to look forward to. Now nah, I will be filled with the Spirit. No, 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 no. As I'm speaking right now, I can be filled with the Holy Spirit at my own will. It's not something I have to wait on God to initiate. It's something I can initiate any single time. And you can do the same. So, but long story short, so Acts chapter 2 was when they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the evidence was speaking in tongues. Let me read from verse 3. The Bible says, Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Verse 4. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages. You will agree with me that this is speaking in tongues. Is that correct? 
You all agree with me, right? All right. So they were speaking in tongues. And then, you know, in the past few weeks, I've been talking about the fact that you can interpret your tongues, right? Of course, you can prophesy without having to interpret your tongues. But if you start with tongues and you start speaking in other tongues, of course, you are getting edified. But if you want to minister to people, if you want to edify people, then you don't stop at tongues. You speak in tongues with the desire to interpret your tongues. And the beautiful thing is when I preached this on Sunday, it was awesome. I think about 98% of the people prophesied. And I say 98% because I didn't give a couple of people mic, just three people, which I'm going to give them the mic next Sunday because our time last Sunday was up. What am I trying to say is that, so you can prophesy without having to speak in tongues, right? You always speak, we just inspire you to encourage, edify, or comfort somebody. You know, prophecy has been mystified. You know, there's something the, the truth of God's word will do for you, actually. When you start seeing some of these truths, the, the, as simple as it is, it just makes all the difference. In fact, the more you get, the more you begin to understand the truth of God's word, you begin to realize that you've always had this gift called discerning of spirit. You know, <laughs> there are so many things coming to my heart right now. The, uh, the discerning of spirit, again, what God gave us is the Holy Spirit. God did not give you this gift, that gift. God did not give Pastor Yinka this gift, and then he gave those and that gift. No, no, no. God is not splitting gifts, right? Or else, someone in our mind will think, oh, Pastor has one gift. Me, I don't have. Or you say, yo, you have one gift. We'll start all of this segregation and all this stuff, right? But God, what God gave you was his spirit. And 1 Corinthians 14, we say, follow after charity and desire spiritual gift. You can desire any gift, and any gift you desire, you can manifest. But says, especially that you may prophesy. So you, if you, if you, for example, I've, I've preached this. When is the best time to prophesy? If somebody call you right now and say, "Oh, brother, sister, I'm going through a tough time," don't just say, "Ah, oh, there's nothing I can do," or don't just say, "Like everywhere is bad, everywhere is hard." No, that is the time. You just say, "Lord, I desire to prophesy to this person before the end of this call." And then while the person is speaking, you say, "You know what?" And this is what God is laying in my heart for you. And then you just speak life. You encourage the person. First Corinthians 14, we will prophesy, speak it unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. So, but over the years, prophecy has been mystified. When I was growing up, I thought, in fact, I used to think only prophets prophesy. That, that was my thought. That you have to be a prophet. God has to call you from heaven. He has to say, my son, my son, wake up. I've called you to prophet the nation. So I thought, oh, except you're a prophet, you can. That was my thought. And so for many years, I shy away from this gift called prophecy. Until one day, some of my, <laughs> day, me and my other friend came out. They set me up. They said, Bro, Sam, prophesy. I said, But I'm not a channel. We always call them channel because we are the denomination I was then. They said, Before you can prophesy, you have to be a channel. So even when God was laying things in my heart, I did not want to say because I said, like, Well, I'm not part of those that, <laughs> those days, that day they set me up and then just myself and the Buddha. I had to prophesy. And since that time, I embraced the ability to prophesy. I've always had it. Nobody needed to, none of them lay hands on me. Right? So what, why am I saying this? What God gave us is his spirit. When a man gets born again, you have the spirit of God. And that means you have the power of God. The Bible says that you shall receive power when? Yeah, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When a man gets born again, does he have the Holy Spirit? Yes. So does that man have power? So power is not something we are looking for. Power is not something you say, Ah, oh, Lord, give me power. That's wrong prayer point. You know, what I'm saying this, and I, I, some of you, I have prayed some of these wrong prayer points in the past, whereby we were begging God for what God has freely given us. He did not just give us, He gave us freely at salvation. Oh Lord, I need power. I need more power. All the power, all the anointing, all the grace, all the you ever need for the rest of your life is already made available in Christ and what He has done for you. God will know. There is no, no, because, you know, in ignoring what Jesus has done at times, we get tempted to establish our own form of, oh Lord, your power. And so we say, oh, I went, one big man of God lay hands on me. It, it doesn't make any difference. You see, there's, if I lay hands on you today, it won't really make any difference if you still don't understand what Jesus has done for you, right? It, it won't profit you. And don't idolize what I, my hands laying on you as opposed to what Jesus has done for you. The Holy Spirit you carry was given to you by God himself as a gift. The Bible says the anointing you have received is true. 1 John 2, 20, 1 John 2, 27. Why am I saying all these things? So you already have the Holy Spirit. That means you can manifest any of the gift that you desire to manifest. Part-time, pretty straightforward. 
if you want to give a word of knowledge right now, just say, Lord, I desire to give a word of knowledge. Pray in all that tongues and you will have a word of knowledge for the person you are praying for. It's pretty straight. We know we, we started with prophecy on last week's Sunday, right? On Sunday, this coming Sunday again, I'll bring everybody out, <laughs> right? I'll bring you out of that. I'll say, okay, now, come on. Come and give a word of knowledge. Come and give a word of wisdom. Okay, let's pray for this person. Everybody pray for this person. So what is God laying in your heart for this person? We'll do a lot. In fact, we'll do it to a point whereby it will be a custom now in this church. So the members say, ah, well, that church, they're always, they're always uh, defying and encouraging people in that church. I want, I, I want us to be, I, actually, we are that kind of church. Right? Whoever you will come and then, in fact, it's going to be awesome. I, I'm, I'm always looking forward to our meetings now, right? Because I just, I just see the manifestations of the spirit, and I'm glad. Why is that? Because we are not just a church that embraces the word, but we also give expression to the manifestation of the spirit. The Bible says concerning spiritual gift, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Because a man can be born again and keep ignoring the things of the spirit. He will say, no, no, me, I don't want to speak in tongues. But you can speak in Why? You have the spirit. So it is not, ah, me, I don't have the gift. Of, mm -mm -mm. And people, over the years, you see, the enemy has a way of playing this game. You make it like, oh, well, you, in fact, the moment the enemy makes you feel as if, well, it is God that decides who has what gift. The moment you believe that, what will happen next is the enemy will not make you feel as if you don't have some particular gift. That's the next thing. He will want to disqualify you. I mean, well, you, you don't. But again, what God gives us is his Holy Spirit. And because you have that spirit, the Holy Spirit comes with a gift. And then because you have the spirit of God, you can speak in tongues. You have the spirit of God, you can prophesy. You can interpret your tongues. You can discern the spirit. You can give word of knowledge. You can give what If you want, if you desire to manifest any of the gifts right now, you can manifest any of them right now. In fact, one of the things the gospel will do for you is not to futurize what Jesus has already done. The gospel will lay more emphasis on the fact that it's already made available in Christ. You already have this in Christ. You already have that in Christ. You are not seeking for breakthrough somewhere. No, 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 no. You already received your breakthrough when we are in Christ. So it's not that, ah, I'm going for that particular meeting. That's where my... No, no. Don't futurize what has already been done and made available by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And let God's people say, Amen. So you received the Spirit of God. That means you can prophesy. In fact, you don't even need instrumental to prophesy. <laughs> right? On Sunday when we were prophesying, there was no instrumental, right? Was there instrumental? There was none, right? We don't, because you don't, it does not. You know what I said this way? I remember in the Old Testament when Elijah, there was a time, we we're going to read that story shortly, but there was a time Elijah wanted to prophesy. Elijah said, you know what? Get me a minstrel. Elijah. Sadly, I'm not happy saying this, but sadly, I've seen believers that they are begging God for double portion of Elijah's anointing. It's an insult. What you have, Elijah does not have. Elijah would, be, would have preferred to pray to have what you have. All they had was a portion. You hear Elijah say, give me double portion, portion, portion. That's what they have. You have the fullness of the Godhead living on your inside. He himself dwells on your inside. In fact, the Bible says, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. He made you one with himself. You are joined here with Christ. You don't have portion. Out of his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. So the gospel has a way of of just making sure that it keeps you, gives you assurance of faith of what the Bible says you already have. It's not that, ah, look, before me I can manifest the gift of discerning of spirit, I have to pray. You know, that, that thought is called stronghold. Because the enemy wants you to ignore what Jesus did for God to freely give you that gift. He now wants you to now somewhere in your mind think you have to achieve. Anything you want to get from God, listen everybody, we are not achieving we are receiving. How did we get born again? We received salvation. Did any of you have to, before you got born again, did you have to pray for 50 days? No, right? No, right? No. Should I tell you something? You know, we get tempted to feel as if we have to pray 10 days, 5 days before God can do only in, in, in any area of our life. But God will give us Jesus for free. Should I blow your mind? When we did not deserve anything good. God gave us heaven's best. In fact, the Bible put it this way that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. So when you got born again, you have, you receive. In fact, Galatians chapter 3, Paul was 
because Paul was part of the people that taught Galatians people. And he was at the point, he was like, ah, ah. I want to use that. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit by walking for it? Or by just hearing of it? Simply means you did not achieve, you did not walk for the Holy Spirit. You received the Holy Spirit. And honestly, it almost as if it takes a lot of effort at times to just rest in Jesus' finished works. Man likes to perform. Man likes to do. But the gospel is you don't have to do. Somebody has done. His name is Jesus. Put your faith in what he has done and your faith will be credited unto you as righteousness. That the Holy Spirit wants to do so many things through you. You just have to rest and allow the Spirit of God to find expression. The Bible says God works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure so when we talk about the gift of the spirit is not something mysterious it's not something we have to pray for it's not something you have to be trusting god for no matter what the gift is it's not you have the holy spirit which is what god gives you and then because you have the spirit of god by the same spirit that you speak in tongues by the same spirit you can interpret your tongues by the same spirit you can prophesy by the same spirit you can give a word of knowledge and so on and so forth by the same spirit so prophecy is nothing mysterious in the Old Testament, actually, even though the Bible calls it Holy Scriptures, but to give you more context, in the Old Testament, so to say, almost as if only prophets prophesy, right? You know, right? Before you, before, before you can prophesy, you have to be a prophet. And then before you can even prophesy, you say something like, and the Spirit of the Lord came on this person, and this person prophesied. But for you, the Spirit of God is not coming and going. He lives in you forever. And let God's people say, Amen. Let me show you a story in the book of Third Kings. Let's open our Bible. Second Kings chapter three. Forgive me. Second Kings chapter three. The book of Second Kings, chapter three. Thank you, Jesus. The book of Second Kings, chapter three. Are we there? Second Kings, chapter three. Are we there? Okay, so we're going to read verse. We're just going to read verse from verse. Let me see, let me see. Should we start from verse 12? Okay, let's start from verse 11. No matter what version you have, let's read together. One, two, go. But Jehoshaphat has, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Let, let's stop there for a second. So they were faced with war. And then now they needed to hear from God. They needed the voice of God. And you know what the king was doing? They need a prophet. You know why? Because only a prophet could prophesy in the hold. <laughs> not just, not just, in fact, this is why, for a second, pause for a second. This is why when Joel was saying, and it shall come to pass in the last days, I will part my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy that is why that prophecy was a prophecy because that's a prophecy of comfort why because once upon a time this thing called prophecy is same not to be available to all but now joel by the spirit of god was saying your sons your daughters will prophesy so it's not just prophet ah you have to be a prophet god has to call you 50. But no no if you get born again today right now you can prophesy right now you don't need anybody to lay hands on you. You don't need any person to tell you that is is one realm you have to get. No, no, you can prophesy now. Like if you get born again now, you can prophesy now. Is there no prophet? Okay, let, let, let's keep reading. An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Safat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Verse 12. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went out to him. Stop. So Jehoshaphat, the king said, you know what? If, if he's a prophet, then the word of the Lord is with him. Guess what? You have the spirit of God living on your inside. Say the word of the Lord is with me. I know what the word of God says. I am not confused. I can hear the voice of God anytime, any day. I always know what to do. I am led by the Spirit of God. Glory to God. The word of the Lord is with him. 
now the same spirit that comes upon them once in a while. In fact, let, let's keep reading. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let, let, let's, let's keep reading. So let's go to verse 13. One, two, go. Elisha said to the king of Israel, why do you want to involve me? Go to the prophet of your father and the prophet of your mother. No, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to deliver us into the hands of Mohab. Verse 14. One to go. Elisha said, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you. But now bring me a harpist. What, what does your version say? Who has any other version? Minstrel, right? Minstrel. While the harpist was praying, or while the minstrel was playing, the hand of the Lord came on Elijah. Stop. So before Elijah can prophesy, he needed a mystery. He needed somebody to sing praise and worship. <laughs> he needed somebody to play instrumental, play part. Because he needed to, in quotes, what people would call get in the mood or get into the atmosphere. But I hope, I, I, I hope you know that as for you, you are not... You are not in and out of any mood. You are always in the spirit, right? The Bible says you are no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. You are in the spirit when you eat, when you are in the bus, when you are driving, when you are in your workplace, when you are in the washroom, you are in the kitchen. You are always in the spirit. You don't need any piano, instrumental before you can prophesy. You know why I'm saying this thing? Because sadly, like I said, right, I've seen a couple of believers try to convert the kind of Elijah's and Elijah's anointing. This guy would prefer to live in our own. In fact, David saw you by the Spirit of God. David said, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven, or better say, whose iniquities are covered. He called you blessed. Glory to God. And then let's just read a bit more forward and they will take it from there. Let us read verse 16, one to go. And he said, this is what the Lord says. I will fulfill this valley with pools of water. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. And you, your cattle and other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also deliver Moab into your hands. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town, you will cut down every good tree. Stop up all the springs and rain every good field with the stones. Stop for a second. Let, let's go back. To, I want to show you something from verse 18. Let's read verse 18 again, no matter what version you have one to go. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also deliver Moab into your hands. Stop. You see, before Elisha came into the picture, Jehoshaphat was very scared. Because based on living by sight, he concluded that, in fact, he said at the point, he said God wanted to deliver him into the hands of Moab. He took them, in quote, a prophet to tell them that actually God is with you. And you see, this is an easy thing for the Lord. <laughs> you know, I play, I coach at YFC. We always say, too easy. This is too easy for the Lord. Right? And then he said, the Lord will deliver them into your hands. That was the prophecy. They needed somebody to encourage them in the Lord. Because before that time, they were down, they were discouraged, and they were looking for a prophet. And then Elisha came and just encouraged them in the Lord. And he said, this is an easy thing in the hands of the Lord. The Lord will deliver them into your hands. You know, when we read things like this, this is for a start, a proof that God still speaks, right? And God doesn't necessarily need your pastor to speak before you can know God is speaking to you. You know, there's, 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 there's this question people ask, oh, how will I know if it's God speaking to me? No, you are not supposed to be asking that question. In the first. How many spirit do you have? One spirit, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? So why, why are you doubting in the first place? I, I think one of these days I'm going to teach on how to be led by God. But it's not something I'm teaching as a mysterious thing. It's something that you're already familiar with. I'll just show you again from the scripture to make you embrace that which... You have already experienced it by the Spirit of God. The Bible says that men that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the 
sons of God. So Elisha prophesied, but he needed to get in the mood first. You remember they brought a minstrel, right? And then you know so many people add minstrel to their name today. No issues with it. My point, and my point is just, well, you know, with or without a minstrel, you don't need, you don't even need music before you can prophesy. You could be in the bush. In fact, there, there was a particular day, I know my wife will remember, when we were about to have All About Jesus Concert 1.0. We went to the venue a day before, and there was this man that they wanted me to meet because that man was, as well was a pastor. So I know um, the owner of the building we're using used to call me pastors at that time, right? Even though I was not a pastor then. Though, but he said oh, he wanted me to meet this particular man of God who was who came around briefly because the daughter or the son just got married to somebody in that particular place. Long story short, so they told him, "Oh, hey, come and meet. You should meet Yinka, and then Yinka, you should meet Pastor. This he's a pastor, blah blah blah." And then when the man met me. First conversation, so oh Yinka, how are you? And then the man just lay hand on my shoulder and he said, Yinka, you know, I just felt as if the Lord wants me to tell you this. And the guy just started ministering to me. He just started encouraging me, prophesying to me. And then it was awesome. Pretty straightforward, no drama. And I was just, <laughs> I was just getting blessed. I was just listening and just I was strengthened. Remember first Corinthians 14:3? First Corinthians 43 says, He will prophesy, speak it unto edification, exhortation, and comfort of the church. You know, if the man had held me by the shoulder and he starts speaking in tongues, you know, he doesn't benefit me, he benefits the man, right? But the man just clear English, what God was laying in his. He said, I feel as if God is saying this, God is saying this, and then, but this is what he just, he blessed me. It's one of the best prophecy moments I've ever had in my life. Because prophecy is not mysterious. There was no instrument. Babe, there was the instrument that daddy. There was no instrument. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? I'm making you understand. It doesn't matter where you are. You are in the bus. Somebody sitting next to you. And you just sense the leadings of the spirit to just encourage the person. Why not if not? Encourage the person. I think I've shared this story here before. One time when I went to Polo Park to go and get something. And then I was about to leave. And there was a particular lady that the Holy Spirit just told me to just go and make sure I just... Put a smile on her face, encourage her. There, it was very specific. You can't miss it. Or if you not say, oh, look, there's somebody you have to encourage. No, no, it, I knew the person. <laughs> it was very specific. You know why I could do that? Because I'm led by the Spirit of God. You know, if I was like Elijah, I would say, get me a mystery. <laughs> uh, maybe you're not caught those in those things. You two come with an Avenger. <laughs> That's a musician, instrumentalist. But we don't need that. You have the Spirit of God living on your hands. You can prophesy anything. This is why I always one billion times say, you don't have any logical reason as a born again to be discouraged. You may feel discouraged, but you don't have to remain discouraged. Why is that? Because you have the spirit of God. What God gave you was his spirit or is his spirit. And then because you have the spirit of God, you have supernatural abilities. You can edify yourself. You can speak in other tongues. You can interpret your tongues. You can prophesy. And more in the context of prophecy now. And I, I think I'm teaching my, And why am I talking about this now? I'm talking about it more in the direction of now you are in, let, let's say you want to make a decision. You want to make life related decisions. You don't need any man of God to decide or to make any decision of your ah, pastor. I'm trying to no, you don't need pastor to make any decision for you. You have the same Holy Spirit. You may get counsel from your pastor, he may give you some words of wisdom or give you, but it, it, it's not that oh. I know in this part of the world, it's not really so common, so I don't even have to talk about it. <laughs> but where I'm coming from, my part of the world, people want to make decisions. They have to feel as if they have to go through their pastor, their pastor. No. no I don't even want to be that kind of pastor. Don't come and meet me. For... <laughs> if you need counsel, the church will give you that, right? The Bible says in the multitude of counselors, their safety, or the multitude of counsel, their safety. But in the context of what is God saying about me, you, 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 you should know what God is saying about you. You don't, you don't need one space. You know, if you understand what I'm talking about, right? You don't need any man of God's validation. You don't have to be seeking the validation of any man of God. You, you don't. You don't. You don't. You have the same spirit. So that's Elisha. I showed you that. Then let's go back to our New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we'll start tying, on, tying it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And then I'll clear some, some of the questions most people ask about tongues as well from first corinthians chapter 14. first corinthians chapter 14 let's just start tying it together are we there first corinthians chapter 14. 
We're going to read verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Thank you, Jesus. Are we there? Now I'm back to my NLT version. Let's all read verse 1. 1, 2, go. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special ability the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. Everybody listen to this. If you've been really, really following this series for a long while, one thing has been consistent. First Corinthians chapter 12 started by saying, do not be ignorant when it comes to spiritual things or spiritual gifts. You, you may remember there's like a long break in First Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13 is all about anybody. First Corinthians chapter 13, what, what is it about? Love. That's what I'm saying. So it's all about love. So it's like the Bible started, listen, the Bible started talking about the gift of the Spirit. And then the Bible took a pause, or Paul took a pause. And then at a point, he just spoke a lot about love. And then at a the point, he says, now these three things will remain forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of them is love. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 now, verse 1, he now said, follow after love or charity. It's almost as if he put a pause on all of the gifts he's speaking about. And he said, you know what? If there's anything you want to follow, follow love. And when it comes to the gift of the spirit that I was talking about, I'm about to continue now. Desire spiritual gift, especially that you may prophesy. Again, when you prophesy, you speak unto edification, exhortation, and comfort of the people around you, right? Of the church, precisely. Prophecy is not a gift for the world. It's not to be using to determine whether my Manchester United will win Barcelona. That's not the aim of prophecy. That's, that's not prophecy. Prophecy is a gift for the body of Christ, for the church to keep God's people encouraged, edified, and comforted. Anyway, but where I'm going with all of this is, so now, listen, so follow the way of love. One of the ways you can follow the way of love, it has a desire spiritual gift. Let me put it to you straight. I know I said this last week, but when you allow the manifestations of the Spirit, when you allow the Holy Spirit to find expression to you, when you encourage a fellow brother or a fellow sister in Christ, that is you allowing or following the way of love. When you give your mind and your attention and you allow the Holy Spirit to find expression to you and you embrace the gift of the Spirit, that is you following the way of love. Is it love when somebody calls you and says, I'm going through this and say, you know what, I'm going to encourage and you encourage the person. Is that love? Yeah, that's love. So that's why the Bible says love will remain forever. And it says follow after love, desire spiritual gift. Don't be running after desire. After, don't be running after spiritual gift. No. Follow the way of love and desire spiritual gift. And then if there's any brother or a sister who needs a word of encouragement, because now, in fact, to put it in proper context, so when we manifest the gift of the Spirit, this is one of the ways by which we serve one another. And then when we serve one another, this is one of the ways by which we show that we love God, or better still, we love one another. Right? So, for example, on Sunday, we were all coming out one after the other to come and encourage other people, right? So what you were doing, let me put it to you this way, you were edifying other brethren, right? Or let me put it, you were encouraging other brethren, right? What, what, have, what have I been doing here for the past 35 minutes in preaching? What will you say I'm doing? I've been encouraging or edifying you, right? I'm teaching you to exhortation. Is that correct? Yeah. So you can say, I have been serving you. What I'm doing is service. I've been serving you for the past 35 minutes. But on Sunday, I called you out one after the other to encourage one another. And then you started coming out one after the other as well to edify, to encourage, to serve God's people. So when we love people, we serve them. Oh, I'm serving the Lord. No, no. When you serve people, you're serving the Lord. You know, people say, ah, me, is Lord, me, I'm serving. I'm not, no, 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 no. Your way of serving the Lord is you serve God's people. And your way of doing that is that you show that you love God's people. In fact, you love them when you allow the Holy Spirit to find expression through you, to encourage, to edify, and to exhort your fellow brothers in Christ. And then God's people say, Amen. So let's jump to verse 3 which I've been quoting often since morning. The Bible says, but one who prophesies, I love NLT, strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. When I was meditating a lot about this, and I remember I mentioned something on Sunday, and I remember I said something like, oh, I'm going to allow God's people to, since we've started talking about tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, 
I'm going to allow God's people to speak in tongues in the context of, Lord, what? how do you want me to serve in this church? Right? And then you will interpret your tongue and then you will know what God is saying to you, where God wants you to serve, right? But I remember when I was meditating on this thing, actually, actually, <laughs> your ministry or your way of service in a church could just be anytime I come to church, I just want to come and encourage one person. Right? Whether I, I do that by coming outside or I don't even come outside, before I leave church today, I'm just going to church today to go and encourage one person. So you say, Lord, I just want to encourage one person. And then at the end of the time, you just say, okay, sister, brother, I just want to encourage you. Or this is what God is laying in my heart for you. That could be your, in fact, that could be your way of service in the church. Right? Am I right? Is, is that service? Yeah. Yeah. What, what is service? You're serving one another. Right? Follow the way of love. The reason I'm serving you right now is because I'm following the way of love. In fact, I'm going to make it a rule. I'm going to announce on Sunday when we have much more people. It, you are coming to church from next time. Before you leave, you know, okay, I'm going to church, number one, to be encouraged and to encourage at least one person. You know, that would be awesome, right? Imagine a church you come to and then you are entering the dance. I would say, hey, brother, hey, sister, so nice to see you. I just want to encourage you. They hold your hand. I just want to encourage you. It would be awesome. Or whenever you come into the church and then you see somebody say, hey, sister, I just want you to know this is what God laid in my heart when I was coming to church about you. Do you think that would be awesome? That would be awesome. More importantly, when we make it a custom. If we do that for a while, imagine somebody comes to church for the first time and then three people coincidentally just go and meet the person and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, this is what God is laying in my heart for you. Brother, this is what God is saying about you. Before the person even start the service, the person has gotten like three prophecies. <laughs> Honestly, that, that would be awesome. That would really be awesome. Is, is, it, is it something that is, is strange or is, is it possible? It's possible. There is, no, again, you know, when I talk about the gift of the I would say, there is nothing mysterious about this thing. I've said this over and over. When I, before I know some of the things I know now, the innocent me, when I started embracing speaking in tongues with a couple of my friends then, every time we gather, we just say, okay, let us pray about this. We pray in tongues for maybe 30 minutes or there about. And then God always, every single time, gives us either word of knowledge or instruction or word of encouragement, edification about that particular thing we're praying about. Every single time. Every single time. Every single time. So first Corinthians, he will, he will prophesy, strengthen others. And I think I was preaching the other day, I said most of the time people confuse this thing called word of knowledge or, or words of wisdom with prophecy. They will say, oh, you have to tell us what's going to happen in the future. That's word of knowledge. That's what the Bible calls, sorry, words of wisdom. Words of wisdom is when you, 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 are, you, can, you have insight of, uh, into what is going to happen in time to come. Word of knowledge is when you have insight about what is either, either happening to somebody or what has happened to somebody. So, but most of the time people conclude, oh, if, if, if you want to prophesy, you have to tell me what will happen in the future. That's, in fact, I, when I was preaching that particular morning, one of these morning devotions, I was teaching on tongues and prophecy. If you, if God gave me an insight about what's going to happen in the next few weeks right now, if I want to communicate it, listen, to God's people, if I don't communicate it with the intention and with the goal of encouraging, comforting, or strengthening you, it's not prophecy. Prophecy is not, oh, there will be rain in five days. That's not, that's not basically right. I got to, even if, even if God shows me there will be rain, even if I see God, that there will be rain, I can't communicate to God's people like that. I have to communicate it to God's people in such a way that I know that it must encourage God's people, right? Strengthen them or comfort them. So even if I know there will be rain, but how does that encourage God's people? Oh, maybe God's people have been trusting God for rain for a long time. You know, that makes it prophecy, right? So I can just say, okay, for many of you that have been trusting God for rain in the next, in the next five days, there will be rain. You can rejoice in the Lord and, and be glad. And that makes it prophecy. Why? Because now I didn't just say, oh, I know what's going to happen. I communicated it in a way that is easy for God's people to understand. And then they are encouraged. You know, you can be praying in tongues and then all you are saying or all you are getting in your spirit is one word. It could maybe strength, for example. Strength. You're like, how will I communicate this to the church? Strength, strength, strength. What does that mean? How will I tell God's people? And then I said, in just same way, praise me. And I said, yeah, come on. And I said, come and tell us what God is laying in your heart. I said, oh, all I keep hearing is strength, strength, strength. <laughs> you, know, could be, you could be more skillful in communicating that same word. One word, God, in your heart. The next thing is, what does the Bible say about strength? 
And then you can encourage us with what the Bible says about the strength that keeps coming to your heart or to your spirit. That also means well, if you are praying, peradventure, and then you feel as if something is coming to your heart, but it's not good news, it won't edify, it won't exhort, it won't comfort the church. You know what? Keep your mouth shut. Don't say it. <laughs> Why? Because the goal of prophecy is it's going to edify, comfort, and exhort the listener. So it is not prophecy if it is bad news. Does, does that make sense? Do we all agree with that? You know, some people say, oh, it is God that showed me. I have to say it. Nope, nope, nope. I don't care how you see, but you know, you gotta we gotta bring everything you see, everything you feel back to this. The Bible says we will prophesy, speak it unto. In fact, the Bible says he strengthens others. You don't say, ah, I see that somebody's gonna die. No, no, that's not prophecy. Don't let anybody <laughs> let's check who, how you see. <laughs> because why? That's why I said, even in your in quote your revelation or whatever you're getting, make sure it still comes back to either edifying, exalting, or comforting God's people. You bring your inspiration, bring it as a subjection to the word of God. You bring it back to the what does the word of God says. Most especially, which I don't think will happen, but in rare cases or few cases, if the enemy is trying to deceive you or he's trying to make, make you feel as if, oh, something bad will happen, and then, no, no, that's not God. You, you should, in fact, that's where this thing we talk about discerning of spirit, the gift comes to play. The same Holy Spirit that helps you to speak in tongues, that gives you ability to prophesy, that gives you ability to interpret your tongues. If there's any inspiration you are getting, or any vision that you are getting, or any dream that you may be getting, or anything that is not in accordance with the word of God, by the same spirit, you will know, no, this is not from God. Discerning of spirit is. <laughs> Is nothing so mysterious. In fact, to make it easy for you to discern, <laughs> if you want to have, if you want to see a lot more of it manifest on a regular basis, you just have to make sure you stay glued to the truth of God's word. The more you embrace the truth of God's word, you don't even have to pray. At times, you hear somebody say, "No, nope, no, nope, that's that's not that's that's not that's not it." Nope, nope. Let me show you a place in the scripture. Let me start wrapping up. A good preacher, I've got five many times, seven times. <laughs> Let me start wrapping up. You know, this is First Corinthians chapter fourteen we are reading, right? Okay, so let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians. The same Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and I'll wrap up on this particular idea. Thank you, Jesus. Then I'll ask us a couple of questions. <laughs> there will be question and answer today. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you, Jesus. Are you there? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Are we all there? 2 Corinthians chapter. 11 are we there so let's start from verse no matter what version you have let us start from verse 3 1 2 go but i fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to christ will be corrupted just as eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different, a different, a different, what, what's in your version? A different one. Are you in verse four? You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus. You know, this i'm not even planning to teach on but i'm already there today right there's such a gift called discerning of spirit so the bible started talking about there's such people who preach what they call a different jesus let me let me let's keep reading you see another thing that than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you so three things a different jesus if i never say another jesus a different spirit am i right and a different gospel you see i could literally make a series on this but i'm not gonna do that i have 10 minutes left to go but because now we're talking about the gift of the spirit we've talked on tongues we've talked on interpretation of tongues we've talked on prophecy and now it looks like if we already we already found ourselves talking about discerning us of spirit and then to make it easy, we came to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, whereby Paul was saying that 
I fear that some are your pure and undiv undivided devotion to Christ. For a start, that means as a born-again believer, Christian, you must be radically devoted to Christ. If you want to listen to teaching, make sure it is pointing you to Christ. You must be devoted to Christ. And then he said, he said, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus. Hmm. How come somebody will preach a different Jesus? You know, I was, I remember when I was preaching about the gospel of Christ here. And I said, you see, if you want to know a false teacher, how do you know a false teacher? How do you know a false prophet? How do you know a false apostle? How do you know all of these false people? Maybe one of these is when we check the book of Revelation. <laughs> but how do you know who is false? How do you know who is true? Number one, you have, again, what we call the Holy Spirit, which gives you the ability to discern spirit. But the Bible is not talking about, you know what? Another way to know is they will start preaching another Jesus, another Holy Spirit, another, in quote, gospel. And I said, if somebody comes here now and, in quote, deny the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, you guys will just say, you know what? You don't want to listen to the person. Collect the mic from the person, <laughs> right? It's always say, oh, Jesus is not the Son of God. You say, no, 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 no. What is pastor saying? Because that one is very easy to find out, right? Right? You just no, no, no. That, 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 that's heresy. But you know what? If somebody comes here and somebody says, if you want God to bless you specially, you have to do some unusual things. These are the kind of prayers you have to pray maybe around 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. if you want to experience the power of God. You know what I just said right now? A piece to logic, but it is not scripture. I just, in fact, I just said something very simple. <laughs> But it is not scripture. Because number one, now the person is trying to create another. Okay, if you want a special kind of power, we read the other time, and I quoted, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is upon you. The born again believer, does he have the Holy Spirit? So does the born again believer has power? Right? So if I say, guys, let us gather today, we have to pray for the power of God. It has to move. Power of God, we want to see the power of God. Let God open the heavens. Let your power... Is this scripture? You know what I just said? <laughs> I just said it's... But you, you know, it appeals to logic. It, what I just said right now, if I make it more dramatic, <laughs> it, it appeals to logic. But we cannot deny that which Jesus did. And that which he gave us, that's why the Bible says, another Holy Spirit, another spirit. The Bible says, another Holy Spirit than the one you received. We received the Holy Spirit. He gave us his power. Jesus said, you are endowed with power when they speak. In fact, the Bible says, thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, God has not given us the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of power. Sound mind, right? I think that's, that's, that's what it says, right? Have you heard that scripture before? The spirit of power. Power is not something that, okay, now I'm born again. Lord, I need power. What, what does that other thing you're looking for? What does it look like? Oh, so I can, I can do miracles. Well, the Bible says you have the Holy Spirit. And the, one of the abilities of the Holy Spirit is you can work miracles. In fact, let me, let me say a statement to you. Jesus said, he who believes in me will do greater works because I go to the Father. Jesus never said you should pray more to see more results. Nope. In fact, that is legalistic and that is not the gospel. If anybody tells you you have to do more to see more, <laughs> if you want to see more, you do more. No, 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 no. Jesus has done. Put your faith in what he has done and you will get results. Again, it has to point back to Jesus. Back to Jesus. What am I doing right now? I'm just shuffling a couple of things to make sure that it's possible that a different Jesus will be wrapped, branded, packaged. But the only difference is that same, that this another Jesus they'll be preaching, that one will be demanding much more from you. The real Jesus that came told us more about what he has done. The gospel they were supposed to preach was more about what he has done. Not more of what you should do. It's what he has done. The person doing is him and he has done and he said it is finished. That is the Jesus in the Bible. But another Jesus will be branded in such a way that, oh, now you have to do more. You have not doing enough. You have not done more. You have to do more. If you want to see more, you do more. You do more. And then he placed a lot of more burden on you. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So another Jesus can be rebranded. Why am I even saying all these things? Because why? You have what they call the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit gives you ability to discern. So that if anybody tells you any other thing, if they say, oh, okay, guys, if you want to experience supernatural power, I want you to come out. I will lay hands on you. It sounds logical. What I just said sounds logical, but it's not the gospel. But it's subtle. 
But the Bible says, if anybody preaches any other Jesus, any other spirit, or any other... <laughs> I just said, you know, so many things come into my mind. But like I said, you know, you have the discerning of God. You will hear a particular Jesus. No, no, that's not scripture. That's, that's, that's another Jesus. Because the Jesus in the Bible, the Jesus that the apostles preach in black and white, they laid more emphasis on what he has done. He has done. Not more things you have to do. In fact, there is a place in John chapter 6. Some people came to meet Jesus. They said, Jesus, what must we do to inherit the kingdom? Have you heard that place before in the scripture? What must we do? Jesus said, just believe. <sighs> humans, don't, humans don't really like that kind of thing. Jesus, I thought you would tell us to just go into the mountain. We will go to the mountain. I thought you said, go to... Jesus said, just believe. <sighs> just believe. That's everything. Faith in Jesus. And actually, that's it. It's just justification by the just shall live by faith. So when it comes to the Jesus that the Bible preached, it's all by faith. Or some say, oh, all, all these people that, that just say, oh, it's all by faith. Well, it's all by faith. I can show you so many Hebrews. Hebrews. You remember the place in the book of Revelation talked about all of fame. But it says, by faith, Moses does this. By faith, Enoch does this. By faith, they do this. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, he's just by faith. That's the Jesus Bible. The Bible says that was the same way Eve was deceived. But now some people are bringing under gospel, they are painting another. It's very subtle. Like I said, they will not come out and just declare and just say, oh, yeah. no, no, no. But they will wrap it, brand it. Some people do it out of innocence. They will not just know much more. But some people are just literal false prophets. False prophets. That's what the Bible calls them. The Bible spoke about them a lot in the book of Revelation. Talking about they are just out to deceive God's people. But you know what? The more you talk about the gift of the Spirit and letting God's people know that there's such a thing called discerning of Spirit, and then you keep repeating the truth of God's Word, and then they embrace the truth of the Gospel, it will be almost impossible for them to be deceived. Almost. Because when you hear another Gospel, you say, nope, nope, this is not the Gospel. This is not pointing me to Jesus. This is not pointing me to what he has done. This is not pointing me to who I am in Christ. This is pointing me to something else. This is telling me that I'm not there yet. So it's not the Gospel. The Gospel of Christ will not give you insecurity about your salvation. It will not give you insecurity about your anointing, about the Holy Spirit. It will give you full assurance of faith about what Jesus has done for you. How he gave you his salvation. How God gave you his Holy Spirit. How God has given you all the fullness of all you will ever need for the rest of your life. That is the true gospel. Lays a lot of emphasis on it. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Are we still here? So that's when we say discerning our spirit, you will know that I'm holding the mic here preaching. You don't know, hold oh, anything else. Nope, 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 nope. I'm, I'm doing this by the Holy Spirit or by, <laughs> by a spirit. And how do you know? The Bible says the Holy Spirit will bear witness of Jesus. Jesus said he will bear witness of me. Have you read that before in your Bible? So if what I'm saying is bearing witness, of, if I'm pointing back to Jesus, then I'm doing it by the Spirit of God. I think I was preaching one church like that, in, sometimes like that, and I say something like that. You will know. What, what am I preaching? What am I laying emphasis on? Because the emphasis of the gospel is on Jesus and what he has done. But if anybody preaches another Jesus that is always demanding you to do much more, do much more, you have not done enough, you have to do this the more, you, until you do this the more, you can't, nope, nope, that's another Jesus. By the spirit you know, nope, no, 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 no. This is not the gospel. No, just, and that's what the Bible calls discerning of spirit. You will discern. No, no, it doesn't matter who is preaching this, but this thing is, is bringing unrest to me. P Paul in the book of Galatians chapter 1, he said, I am surprised that you are moved and you are turning to another gospel, which is not another. He said, there are some who are trying to I think the word is disturb you. They're trying to disturb you. It's like when somebody is trying to unsettle you. Imagine you come to church encouraged. You know, you are born again by faith. You know you have the power of God. And then you get to church. You hear somebody say, hey, before you can access some power in God. You're like, that, that is giving you unrest about what you are. Right? Because you came encouraged. Now you're going home discouraged. You're not even sure that you have the power. But imagine if you come to church and the preacher is telling you, you have the power of God. You have the spirit of God. And because you have the spirit of God, you have the gift of the spirit. You are not trying to look for it. You already have it. You just have to allow yourself to desire it. And you can manifest it anytime. And the preacher keeps reminding you, pointing you, and telling you that Jesus has done it. Acknowledge, embrace it, agree with it. And then you will see manifestation. 
And I've, I've, I've seen God's people in this church respond to that truth. But I just, you know what, if, Jesus, if I have it, let me manifest it. That's what we call discerning our spirit. You will know. You will know. This, you see, the, the, the beautiful thing about the things of the spirit, the more you talk about it, the more you get more conscious about it. Much more conscious about it. That, that's, the, that, that's, that's the way it is. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Glory to God. Let, let's rise to our feet. I got to wrap up this service. I have so much to say, but I feel as if I don't want to say everything today. Sunday is the best good time to actually say much more of the things in my heart. But this is what I'm trying to say. You have the Spirit of God. It's priceless. It's priceless. Another gospel is if somebody tells you you have to get double portion of Elijah, that's another gospel. That's another spirit. You don't need portion. You have the fullness of the God that dwelling on your inside. And then you begin to discern. No, no, no. This is not in accordance with the word of God. Glory to Jesus. Father, we thank you.